And I muted the whole time. Yeah, totally. I, I blew away a window that I meant to not blow away, and I muted because I'm stupid. So, hi everybody! It's Nick McPhee being random and uncoordinated once again on the internet. Um, <clears throat> so, Unhindered by Coding, back again for another two hours of fun and excitement, um, or at least software development. Um, uh, so if you're new here, I am teaching myself Rust um, as a task. Well, task, that's a strong word. I'm taking this opportunity, since I have time because I'm on sabbatical, uh, to learn some new things. And one of those new things is Rust. And you can't really learn a language unless you build something or several somethings with it. And so I'm building several somethings in Rust. And one of them is a simple evolutionary computation genetic algorithm system um, because, among other things, I want to compare performance of the um, evolutionary comp uh, a Rust-based system to a closure-based system. Um, have mostly worked in closure for the last decade or so and want to see how much faster Rust really is. It's early results on a very simple system suggest maybe a factor of 100, which is huge. I mean, that's enormous. Um, I'm really interested in seeing what that looks like when I get to a genetic programming system where, where, we're, where we are evolving programs that have to be interpreted. Um, and so that's definitely kind of where I'm headed. But uh, I wanted to start with just a simple GA um, to see how that would play out. Um, so plan for tonight is I did a little work offline. I added clap for some command line arguments. And I should mention sort of how what I did there um, in case there's any, anybody's got any like, oh, that was a terrible idea. Um, uh, or other suggestions. And then there's a pretty simple thing we could do, which is extend population selector to a weighted population selector. And then I've got to decide um, where, how far I want to push this pipelining, mutation, and recombination stuff. Um, I think I'm, I'm kind of prone to overgeneralizing rather badly here. And maybe since my real goal is performance comparison, I should step away from building the most super general thing in the world until I'm actually doing performance comparisons. And then if and when those show that Rust is vastly better, um or at least better enough to be worth the trouble, then trying to build a super general evolution computation system in Rust starts to make sense. But I think I should be getting some data and not trying to build the most general thing in the world. So we might not do a whole lot of the pipeline recombination stuff, but there are some cool possibilities there. Um, oh, is that one of the windows I blew away? Oh no, there's inventory. That's so weird. Huh. Um, uh, Izitsu actually mentioned on the Discord, I want to guess it would be useful. I can share the uh, Discord invite link. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, Izitsu mentioned on the Discord link uh, that there was this inventory crate, um, which apparently was broken for a while, but uh, seems to be uh, working again. And you can create some sort of type and tell the inventory to collect instances of that type. And you can submit anywhere in your code instances of that type um, and then iterate over them. Um, and so you can have a thing that anywhere in the code, people can add instances of that thing, and then you can use them in some way. And that could be cool for like 
having a flexible way of collecting selectors or mutators or recombination operators um, or pipelines, things like that. Um, and also, Zitsu has done some sort of very cool stuff, again, on Discord mostly, about possibly using um, building pipelines uh, with things like and then um, or and and then um, that looked really nifty and might be interesting to explore. But for the moment, I think I'm going to focus on trying to keep it simple so that we can actually get some performance data. And one question, which I'll ask now, but not necessarily kind of wait on, but if, if you've got thoughts on it, absolutely share, is I've been for the past however many, I think this is the fifth episode um, on evolution computation, been focusing on the implementation in Rust. I also have a real simple implementation in Clojure, not our kind of production system, but I have a simple system that's was meant to be kind of more comparable to the Rust system. And the Rust system's gotten out ahead, ahead of it a little bit. And so there's some pieces I would have to add um, to, oh, and actually we should definitely, if this, if we get this done, um, you know, we should implement Lexicase. Um, ba -ba -da -ba -da. Implement lexicase selection. And that's going to have some comp, add some complications that we're going to have to deal with. And I'll explain what that is when we get, if and when we get there. Um, and yeah. So, um, so the question that I want to throw out and have people mull over. And you can share thoughts here or in Discord or um, wherever, um, Twitter. Um, is do you want to see the closure side of this here? Um, this has sort of become a pretty much Rust only um, stream. That hadn't necessarily been my intention, although it was never not my intention. That's just kind of a thing that happened. Um, and there is some closure code that's going to need to be written for me to have sort of meaningful timing comparisons. And if people would like that to be part of what's happening here, totally awesome. If people are like, nope, I come here for the rust and I don't really care about the closure. That's also totally awesome. Um, and also I could just advertise like, hey, for the next two, three weeks, it's going to be closure come or don't as you see fit. Um, but uh, if you've got thoughts on that, absolutely share, please. So let me first show the clap stuff and then we'll look at the population selector business. Um, so um, main so I added, there's an args type that's in Rust GA args. So that's over here in this um, module. And we bring it in and we parse it, um, which is clap. And then we call do main. And I just pass the args thing as a way of like saying, here's the value of the arguments that I care about. Um, and I don't know if that's kind of the normal way to do this, um, but it seemed like my arg struct had what I needed and I couldn't see a reason not to just pass it around. So I passed it around. Um, so in, I, I created two enums to deal with two command line arguments that, that had a, a finite number of choices. And I'm not super thrilled about the enums. I mean, actually, they work beautifully. I'm super happy about how they work. The, the, the main thing is they're not very flexible in that um, if I wanted, in particular, to add a different target problem, somebody would have to come in here and edit this code. And that doesn't seem 
awesome. Um, and in closure, uh, we actually literally just pass in a namespace function name as a command line argument. Um, uh, so it'd be like closish.problems.count ones. And that would be a function count ones in a namespace that was closish.problems. And it would run that problem because we can map from that string to a function name because the type system's like, sure, I don't care about any of that. Um, I don't know if there's any good way we could do something like that in Rust because, yeah, I don't know if you can map like from a string to the name of a function. I mean, this is essentially reflection, I guess, um, in the Java land. And oh, maybe that's what I should have been searching for is reflection. Um, and I can't imagine. Um, that the type system is going to be, well, maybe. Hmm. Well, maybe. So I, I'll need to read this. I'm not going to make you all sit and stare at it while I'm contemplating my navel. But um, it. so it is actually basically reflection. It took me too long to, to realize that that I'm looking for. So I'll have to do some homework and see if something reflection-y is possible. But at the moment, I have uh, two run models, serial and parallel. Um, so do you want to run the evolution um, serially without using any parallelism? Or do you want to do parallel um, evaluation? Um, and then target problem. We have two target problems at the moment. Um, and there's a clap value enum that if you apply to these, then clap's able to parse um, things happily. Um, so down here in the args, uh, we say um, run model, and it like knows what to do with the parsing there. Um, oh no, actually, I think we tell it here. So we tell it it's an enum here. And then I provide a default value, which is to run in parallel, and a default value, which is to do the HIF problem. And I went ahead and threw in population size and number of bits in a bit string and the number of generations to run. So now you can set all these things on the command line. And that's really nifty uh, and makes me happy. So we can do things like uh, cargo run minus minus run model serial um let's say target problem count ones and num generations just do like 10 and it should or i can't spell oh i didn't say minus minus duh So it did gener 10 generations of count ones um, serially. Uh, so it didn't use uh, any of the parallel iterators. So that was actually pretty neat. And that all gets used here in domain um, where um, we get the args as an input and we can do things like grab the population size and the bit length and we can match on target problem uh, to essentially this is converting. So this is doing the reflection, um, but in a very limited way. So it's taking the value of this target problem and mapping it to a function. So count ones here is a function that takes a slice of Booleans and returns an integer and HIF does the same. So we're sort of mapping to the functions here and using those as compute score. And uh, we use number generations there. And the run model, um, depending on whether we want to run serially or par in parallel, 
we either call it generation next or generation par next. And we had par next before. Um, and is it Sue? It had the suggestion of having adding next as well that just runs things serially. And so th I when I did that offline as well, um, had a little fit and did some programming because I like programming. Um, and I like doing it with you folks, but I also just do it sometimes because I can't help myself. Um, and so this is pretty straightforward. Um, in fact, there's, there's enough duplication here. I almost felt like I needed to do something about it. And then there wasn't quite enough to bother. I was like, oh, I'm not quite sure that I wanted to like try to refactor some common piece out of this. Um, the, the loop is sort of the main difference. Um, uh, instead of into par iterator, uh, we just map. Um, we don't have to do anything fancy. And we don't have the map init business um, and then this need for a map that maps the number to uh, the generation um, because we can just capture uh, the generation and or pass the generation and the um, uh, random number generator is arguments to make child right here. Um, so that was a little simpler. Um, so did all that. Um, and that was all nifty. Um, I think the only thing about it that I was a little uncertain about was again, having, um, uh, you know, just these two things here is quite limiting if people want to be able to run their own problems, which they're going to want to. And I think maybe reflection is the thing I have to learn more about. So I will go off and I will learn more things about reflection at another time. Um, so in, so that was this part. Hopefully that made sense. Questions, comments would be obviously welcome. It's one thing that's weird about Twitch is of course I can't see anybody's face, which is, so in a classroom, you can like look at the room and get a sense of like, do people seem happy? Like they kind of understand and they're nodding or people seem really baffled or people have tuned out and are all checking Facebook. Um, like you can do some things in reading the room and teaching online or streaming, which are actually reasonably similar experiences. Uh, one of the big downsides is you really have no idea what your audience, how they're feeling about things. You're just kind of like have to hope and press on. Um, and when we went online in spring of 2020 because of COVID, um, yeah, that was definitely an issue uh, and remained one through really a year, year and a half before we got back to semi-regular. But even then we had, when I was teaching still in the spring, people were wearing masks for the most part because um, it was required in classrooms still. It is not anymore. And, but I'm not teaching this semester, so I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. That's very kind. Um, given how late it is for you, man, if you were asleep, I would totally cut you the slack. I promise. Um, um, uh, you know, and nobody can see you sleeping, unlike in a classroom. Um, so, uh, yeah, now that we're um, sort of, even with face to face mass made it a little hard to read the room harder than without so it'll be interesting to see kind of what that's like in a year when i'm back in the classroom so i'm gonna go for this guy here because that'll be easy i think um uh is right now our population selector and where is that population selector uh, nothing but in, oh, I'm, it's probably just selector. Uh, pub type selector. Yeah. Um, so we have some, uh, right here, we have an array of selectors. So it's really this 
this is the thing that I was talking about. So we have an array of selectors, and those selectors are treated uniformly. Um, so when we use them, which happens in uh, generation in make ch oh yeah because it's in lib because we pass in the make child thing um right yes oh no we call get parent so it's in generation i was so get parent chooses a selector entirely at random uniformly so if we have several ways of choosing a parent we don't get to specify any kind of weighting among them. They are all equally likely to be used. And that isn't really how people tend to do this in the wild. Um, so where we, for example, here, um, we set the selectors here to be this vector, which has best score, which really should be best individual. That's not a good name. Um, but this gives us the individual with an individual with the best score, because there could be ties, in which case it'll pick, I think it picks the last one. Um, a random, totally random individual ignoring um, the score. Uh, two instances of binary tournament and one instance of decimal tournament. So this is basically a cheap way of weighting binary tournament more highly than the others. Um, so this is twice, we're twice as likely to select a parent with binary tournament as with any of these other three. We're um, three times as likely to use some form of tournament selection as the other two, yada, yada. And in particular, one would usually have something like best score be quite sparing. Um, you would not want to copy the best individual too many times into the next generation. That's going to give you a very tight, um, strong selection pressure, and you'll tend to drive out diversity pretty quickly that way. So that's actually like having it be 20% of the population be copies of the best individual, almost certainly not at well mutated copies of the best individual, almost certainly not a good idea. So it'd be nice if these were, instead of um, just a straight vector, uh, we had instead uh, a uh, weighted parent selection um, structure. And there is this weighted choice thing here. Um, that um, if we have a vector of weighted things, which have weights and values, then we can construct a weighted choice out distribution out of that. Well, I guess this is the distribution. Create a weighted choice thing out of that distribution and then ask, we can sample that um, and get things that are weighted appropriately. So this is what I want to do. I want this um, instead of what I have. So we are going to need to add. Oh, no, we don't need to add anything. This is in Rand, so we should have it. Oh, that's nifty. Okay, so in theory, weighted should be there. So if I come to here and I make this way and weighted takes a weight and an item. So this will be the item. And then I will need to add a weight. And do, 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 do. we could do something like if we do it all relative to the population size, then we could 
know what we expect in terms of the population size. So if we have like 0 0.05 times args that population size, now it's not going to know about this so we're going to have to import um probably gonna need all of those uh not happy um that's probably not going to be good yeah so I feel like I am going to have to, I feel like somehow this is, I need to pull this in. It doesn't say that I do. And I assume I have Rand in my, let's see what I've got in uh, cargo.toml. I have RAND 085 and this is RAND 056. Oh, it's even, oh, maybe that's the problem. Oh, look at that. It's not here. So where did they move it to? That's a fascinating question. Distributions. Non-uniform sampling. Weighted index. Oh, they changed the name. And I also need to add a feature alloc. Poop, poop, poop. Okay, well, we can do that. So I need Rand. Here we are. Version equals features equal alloc. So I assume alloc has something to do with allocating memory and it needed for some reason to be able to do some memory allocation. So they decided to go with this. I don't know. Oh, weird. So now they've separated the choices and the weights into two vectors. Well, that's fascinating. Huh. Don't know that I'm a fan, but you know, I didn't make all the rules. I'm using other people's good work. So, okay. So we don't have weighted anymore. Um, so really we've just got so the selectors are what we had before and we want let selection weights selector weights to be uh, I guess we could say vec u size I don't know what do they what do they use here Oh, they don't actually say. We just have a array of them. So maybe we don't care. We just say, you have an array. Um, and I'll say, I want uh, population, args.population size times like 0 0.05. Um, and uh, the number of randomly chosen individuals probably shouldn't be huge. Um, we could do something like 20%. And we'll do binary. It'll be 50%. Um, and Decimal tournament will be the remaining 20%.
25%. I think that, oops, I needed a open square bracket there. Boink, boink. Um, oops, come on. And we could actually, get dark. So it'd be a little easier to see how things line up. Okay. And that does add up to 100%. So not that it probably matters. Oh, it says check the choose weighted in the docs. I should look at that. Um. Search, choose weighted. Uh, I'm doing something wrong because I'm not finding. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, slice random. Choose weighted, and the, the choices are things or pairs. Oh. Oh, yeah. So that's actually probably better. I like that better because I like having them together. Having the parallel arrays annoyed me. So, um, yeah. I agree. I think keeping things together definitely makes me happier. So we come back and we do this again. Now the items are first in the pairs and the um, weights are second. So weighted selectors are best score and this. and random and this and binary tournament and this and decimal tournament and that. Okay, and then this all goes away. And we're unhappy because um oh weird. So I th presume the problem is here is that I'm multiplying a U size by a float and it doesn't know what to do about that. Um, problem is the type annotation. Oh, yeah, duh. So actually, let's just lose that. I'm not quite sure why. I had that in the first. Well, actually, what is, let's leave it and let's make sure it's what choose weights want. Choose weights. Um, choices. Oh, interesting. So it's, since it's attached to slice random, it's assuming that. Uh, so self needs to be some pairs, but interestingly, that's not in this. 
type description anywhere. But it needs to be array or vector of pairs. And I don't see the pair part in the, um, oh, I guess weight is the thing that takes an item and gives us the weight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. I'm using these pairs here and that's what the item if I do it their way the item dot one is what gets the weight yeah I'm there okay I was I was somehow thinking that they were hard wired into this pair approach but they're really not they're being much more flexible than that um, and they need a weight to be of type F um no actually that's the function that returns a value of type b and a b is a sample borrow of x wow um well no don't do that go away so i guess i i would i think i was hung up on whether these were going to be allowed to be floats and maybe there's no reason they can't be um, as long they're it's probably pretty general so i think we could say that this is a vector of selectors comma f32 boom oh and then it mostly works except it doesn't Cannot multiply u size by float. Um, so I would have to turn something into. Uh, oh, so it's a, it's actually the u size. If it if it had, ugh, if it had been an i, I'd be okay. Well, that's annoying. Um, I mean, I could presumably say like as something here as I 64. No, that did not do the right thing. Cannot multiply an I 64. Oh, I can only multiply. So I, I would actually have to say as an F like 32 and then, yeah, weird. Okay. And we'll do that for all of them. Further evidence, you should never use floating point arithmetic if at all possible. Because floating point arithmetic is gross. Oh, and I lost a comma at the end of this guy somehow. Okay. Whew. Okay. Now, um, so that makes this thing and then generation is going to need to be oh it's gonna to have to be a weighted thing isn't it so it's generations selector is gonna to have to have this type so that's generation um so selectors is going to have to be a reference to this thing. And we're going to need tick, oops, ah, ah, tick A here. And, oh, and this is going to need to be T. Okay. 
Uh, that seems plausible. Then back to lib, we have an issue. Oh, actually, while we're here, this is going to have to be this. Really, probably ought to like have a named type for this because this is going to be ickly. Um, and if I'd had a named type, I wouldn't have to repeat repeatedly fix things. Um, line forty four isn't happy. Oh, because that's where we do the choose. Okay, so we'll come back to that in a hot second. And then this is not. Oh, this is now weighted selectors. Oh, and the name of the field actually probably ought to be weighted selectors. Weighted selectors, which is going to break all kinds of things. still be broken and okay that takes care of most of that and this now is compiling because this doesn't do any of the actual selecting because that happens in generation um so to generation line 26 i still refer to selectors stop referring to selectors and okay now 41 this is where we're choosing and that doesn't work so we need, we need choices dot choose weighted. I'm just going to grab all this. Um, come on. Self dot weighted selectors dot choose weighted. It's going to take the random number generator. It's going to take this closure that returns the second field. And then calls unwrap and gives us the first field because we're going to get the pair back. And that actually compiles. Whoa, yes. Um, that's a little crazy, but it does work. Or at least it compiles. And then we have um, in lib. Got a warning about that not needing to be there. And yeah. So, in theory, that might work and might give us a more reasonable weighting of. And in fact, actually, if we can just take. I've been, I've been focused on this being having to be integers somehow but really if we can have floating point numbers i don't need to multiply by the population size i can just say i want five percent to be one thing and in fact i don't even need um, these floating point numbers i could do this with integers which would probably make me happier um Yeah, I mean, I could do something just like this, and I think it'll make it easier to read. Yep. 
Yeah. I think that'll work. Oh, hey. Oh, but then if <laughs> I'd put F um, F32 in everywhere, and now this is um, U size, because it really, or actually, I could do something probably, probably even do something like U8. Because really, these shouldn't be big, weird numbers. But, eh, eh, eh. You size will do. Um, and now that has bled all over everywhere. Again, because I didn't make a name type. Bad me. So, that's going to like blow up all kinds of stuff. Actually, maybe I should just make the name type. Since I've been burned by it twice. Um, pub type weighted selector of type T is a pair that is a selector of type T and a U size. Can't spell. Can't, still can't spell. Oh, come on. And then this becomes a oh but I need the this is a reference so I need that and I need that and now I have a vec of weighted selector of tick A and T. Does that part work? Yes. Now this is going to be a VEC weighted selector and boom and where else are we? Oh. Is there no one else, nowhere else where we're dying? Really? I thought that was going to end up in more places. But apparently not. I just, I changed the name and that let, ended up all over the place. But changing the type didn't actually make that much difference. Um, but we could change this to be a VEC of weighted selector. And it doesn't know what that is. Use crate generation weighted selector. And it doesn't know what these are. So T is bit string. And A is static I want this to last the entire run of the program I think oh or remove the lifetime oh and it inferred it oh good well that's much nicer I think this is something I don't have good intuition about. I feel like, you know, parts of me are like, Rust is very pedantic. And if I have two things, I must provide two things. And then there are other times where it turns out where it's like, Rust is pedantic, but also smart and can figure stuff out. And you don't always have to provide all the things. But I, I kind of get in the mindset of, Oh, I'm going to have to say all this stuff. And then I forget that I can include some of it and leave some of it out. Okay. So, in theory... Um, oh, there's an unused import. Oh, yeah, because that doesn't... Oh, and actually, so it was actually generation weighted selector 
if I want to be more consistent, and that would go away. Yeah. So it all compiles. Let's see if it runs. Wooha. So let's leave everything else alone because that'll make it go fast. And I won't interfere too badly with my streaming, I hope. Do, 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 do. Hey, it ran. Um, and if I say... Um, population size thousand. Oh, wow. Yeah. I think that definitely improved the performance because we got up into the 500s very quickly there. And I don't know if it'll do it again. That could have just been good luck. Oh, no. We're, oh, we're over 600 now. And I rarely saw, almost never saw 600 and high, oh, 644 and high fives were pretty rare um, with the previous set of selection tools. So I think that uh, changing the selection um, regime uh almost certainly did make a meaningful difference. Interesting. Well, that's cool. Good job. So these things matter. Um, and I'm by no means saying that these are the right things to do. Um, in fact, this is probably too high. Having 20% of the parents be completely randomly chosen, probably not awesome. Um, in fact, it would probably be better if 20% of the parents were randomly generated, like completely new individuals. That would probably be a better thing, but not going to worry about that. We are not here to spend a great deal of time trying to solve this particular problem. So that seems like a thing. Um... Uh, so I think we'll say that, go ahead and commit all this as, yeah, that all looks good. So, um, change from uniform to weighted selectors. Um, this uses, um... Oh yeah, totally. That's not a bad idea because I agree that this is not a great view. Um, I mean, part of the, you know, when you have 128 or a thousand or something, even zeros and ones isn't awesome, um, but it's better, arguably, um, and things will line up better than they are with true and false because true and false don't have the same number of letters. So let's do that in just a sec. I think that's a good idea. Um, so this uses um, the choose weighted method in slice random to select, so we'll say to choose, selectors from a weighted distribution um, instead of a uniform distribution as before. Boom. So let's actually quick see if we can do oops that was not where I wanted to be so bit string we want to implement a display on bit string um, Now, I'm not going to be able to impl something on this, though. 
right? Because I'm going to get a impl um, display for bit string, and I'm going to get a shouty thing. Uh, doesn't know about that, so let's import it quick. Uh, I think I want that one. Um, and now it's going to be shouty because I didn't. Uh, oh, I don't want a semicolon. Fine, fine, fine. fine, fine. Oh, come on. Get me to the problem. Only traits defined in the current crate can be implemented for traits defined outside of the crate. So because it's a vec bool, I can't do an impl on it. Um, if I made it a wrapper around a vec bool, I could do a bunch of stuff. But that's why things like these are not defined in an impl block because I can't impl on vec bools. Um, so is there, I mean, I guess I could just write a display function and where I print things out, call it. There's nothing to stop me from doing that. So I could, instead of having impl display, um, so with, what would that, would that look like pub trait and then Then how, how? I'm not sure how I get the what the what it looks like to sort of put the vec bool in there. Um, oh, that would be that's a possibility. Implement by doing it around individual vec bool. That is totally doable. Well, I like that plan. I feel like I need to learn something more about custom traits though than I possess in my brain um, but we could totally do that so actually that's in bitstring now that I think about it I impl a bunch of stuff on uh, individual bitstring yeah so and that's more individual bit string. Don't really need, there are two separate things here, but, um, so I could say, impl display for individual bit string. And then this is going to be grumpy because I don't have a thumped function. So I need a thumped. So pub fn oops, thumped and thumped takes a. Oh, oh. So it would have maybe um, implement missing members. Oh, oh, look at that. Good job. And it even put the to-do in. Man, that's cool. I didn't realize it did that. That's nifty. I like that. So we get ourselves and we get a formatter. And we want to return a format result. So, actually, I don't know what these guys look like. Rust, display, tray. So, we call right bang. 
and then we pass it the formatter, we pass it a format string and the arguments, and that that will do the right thing. Okay, that's a thing I think I can do. Um, so, except we're going to need to push things onto a string because we're going to need to loop over the um, bits. Uh, so we're going to have something like string result uh, equals start with that to string and then a let oh it's not ah um then we're gonna need to say self dot genome dot for uh Uh, I want for bit in self genome and then if bit result dot push one else result dot push zero and then result dot push close and now we say right f um, and just result Oh yeah, good catch. All right, so we actually, what are we doing here? So we, we've just so far been printing the, the individual as a struct. Um, we could just follow this same format maybe actually getting fancy and indenting genome and score so they're going to be a little easier to see um, oh um, yeah okay I buy that um, so then this would be uh, that open paren blah, 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 with result being the first piece and uh, self dot score being the second and in fact thinking about it I didn't really need to do the square brackets because I can just put those in here So this would be like string dot string new and we could get rid of that line there. No, I did something I was not supposed to do. Oh, we return that. It's not a side effecting activity. It is the thing that we return. And we probably need to import something core dot macros quick fix oh I left out the bang I see oh, nope, not, not there boom bop okay oh let mute can't push if it's not mutable and uh, didn't like that because I take ownership of it well, that's annoying. Um, quick 
quick fix. Iterating over a slice of vec bool, which I think is kind of what I was, oh, is it just make a reference? And then this needs to be star bit. Huh. Well, okay. That worked. Um, cool. Uh, and Clippy's happier if I have semicolons there so it doesn't look like I'm trying to return something. Okay. So now, in theory, doodly doodly do, do doodly do. Whoa. Oh, I didn't. <laughs> I never said to actually call um, any of that. So we've got to stop it from doing that. So that must be in lib, I think. Um, yeah, right here. And so I need to say something like uh, best is an individual. So I think I can just say best dot, oh, but that's, oh, because it went into debug. And if I remove that, it'll use display and it will hopefully do the right thing. Hey, hey, look at that. And it almost fits on one line. That is so much better, actually. Um, because we can totally see where the blocks of ones and zeros are. That is Spifferoonie. I like that a lot. Yeah, so there's a lot more randomness at the beginning, and then it settles in. And in this problem, since we, I don't know that we ever talked about this problem, but in this problem, the, the, the best solution is either all zeros or all ones. But you get points for having sub blocks that are powers of two. Um, that are all the same. So this gets credit, this gets four points for being the same, but this doesn't get eight points for being the same because it's not. Um, and I think what's gonna happen is that this gets four points for being the same. And this is probably five, six, seven, eight. So those eight will get points for being the same. Yeah. So you can also pad the generation number to fit if you add more. Oh, oh, I see. So that these line up correctly. Um, uh, and we know what the largest generation number is because that's right here. So I assume there's a way to pad in print lines. I don't know what that looks like. Um, Rust um, pad print line. So it's in, aha, uh -huh. that, um, so that gives me leading zeros. Um, I don't really, well, it could actually leading zeros wouldn't be terrible. And then that number of positions. Um, but I bet I can probably, I suspect that if I did colon and a number and left the zero out, I probably would just get the right thing. Um, we say colon uh, four. It's probably more than we need, but um, certainly more in this little example. But we can see that it works. Yeah. Yes, it is a little more than we needed. Um, 
the moment we're only ever using two. So, boom. Oops. So let's change this to two for now. Technically, we probably want to like find the number of generations and figure out what the um, minimal number of um, spaces you need is. Um, ooh, that one's very good. Uh, only two little blocks of zeros left behind. Very cool. Very cool. And this is actually running, this is being much more successful than it was um, when I had the uniform uh, selection system. So adding that little uh, weighted selection actually made a big difference, um, which doesn't entirely surprise me, but it's still kind of nice to see that it happened. Um, so we should... What have we done? We have added display. Oh, actually, I should make a note that um, uh, to do change two to be the smallest number of digits needed to needed for uh, args dot num generations minus one. Boom. But I don't want to deal with that now. That's it's not going to be hard, but it's not going to be interesting either. Um, so we added this display, and and we used it. That's all we did. Um, um, let's see, have. individual bit string impl display. This provides a simple display implementation of uh, individual bit string as a sequence of zeros and ones instead of trues and falses, um, which greatly improves readability. And one thing that's worth noting is, I don't remember what my thing is, but um, this is so cool because it will tell me. No, oh, it has to recompile, but populate, uh, no, let's see, uh, bit length. That's what I wanted. Um, man, I am a big fan of clap. Um, so now if we make this longer, so I don't know, 512, then our display isn't going to be as useful. Um, but there's really nothing to be done about that other than make the text super tiny and the window super wide. Um, but still we can see that um, the blocks are easier, a lot easier to see here than they were um, when we were doing everything with trues and falses. Um, and it's interesting. We are actually consistently improving even almost a hundred generations out that's surprising to me um okay it looks like we probably mostly stalled out there and notice that with the much larger sequence of bits um there's much less consistency um it's harder for it to know because you know it liked this because this gave it points early on here. But if it had only done ones instead of zeros, then this would have gotten it more points. But of course, if it had done zeros instead of ones here, this would have given, given it way more points because we'd have all these zeros here. Um, and so there's a lot of kind of short-term gains will not necessarily lead to long-term success um, with that setup. Um, but that's, 
Oh, that very first one is not printing. That's probably happening right here. So in fact, if we take that out, then I think, um, let's kill that, rewrite, recompile, do, 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 do. Yeah, okay, now we get a more reasonable Cool. That is quite spiffy. I like that a lot. And that just gets better and better. What time is it? Oh, it's only 8.15. We're doing pretty good. Um, okay, you don't want to sit here and watch this run. That is going to be boring. Um, I must... Uh, it's a sign of my interest in this kind of thing. I could just sit and watch evolution runs happen all day long, and it would be bad if I did that. So I'm actually going to amend this to the previous commit because I haven't pushed that yet. Because um, that's really just part of the same thing. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I agree 100%. So now... Um, I think we should see if we could implement lexicase selection. And that is gonna break a bunch of stuff. But it's an important selection operator that's very widely used and would make the timing comparisons that I wanna do more interesting. So I think it's worth dealing with it. Um, and this is likely to break. The, I probably should have made a branch there, and I didn't. Well, I'm going to make one now. Actually, I'm going to push you, and then I'm going to make a branch. Implement left case selection. Because this is possibly going to break all kinds of things. So left case selection is a little hard to explain. Um, uh, the basic idea, boom, I'm going to come over here. Um, lexicase selection. Uh, so the key point is instead of creating an aggregate score, um, you have a vector of scores. And in the case of if uh, let's do this with 128 again actually let's do it with 64 just because it'll be like super fast oh interesting you got stuck thought i was wondering if maybe it would even just solve this so um with if every bit counts as a thing every adjacent well no er, not every pair because it's the first two and then the next two after that so we don't have overlapping windows like this doesn't get scored um the next scored window pair would be this that gets scored these four get scored groups of eight get scored i'm not going to count these over and over again 16 32, in this case up to 64. So we're counting all of these blocks, size 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. Um, and you get points for every block that's all the same. Um, and you don't get points for blocks that are not the same. So this group of 4 would not get any points. And this group of two doesn't get any points because those two are different. Um, and this group of two wouldn't get any points. This group of two would. This group of two would, etc. Um, and I'm willing to bet that that group of four is probably on a boundary of four. Um, and so it's getting scored as a group of four. Um, 
and this group of four is probably on a boundary of four. Um, and it's interesting. Oh, yeah. So this is probably, let's count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Yeah. So this group of 16 gets scored as a group. So you get the all the 16 zeros, the eight pairs, the four groups of four, the two groups of eight, and the whole group of 16. And so this, having this group of four be zeros is good because it gives us this whole group of 16. And these weren't part of a group of 16 ones because the boundary didn't work out um so there is a local advantage to making this change even though it leads in some sense farther away from the global optimum which in this case would be all ones um uh so okay so let's case selection we would instead of having an aggregate score in this case the sum of all of these numbers we have a vector of scores, so we keep the data separate. And um, for each selection event, we um, shuffle the order of the scores. Um, so we basically take, we've got all the scores, we decide to approach them in some random order. Um, for each individual, let's see, for the first score, um, uh, remove every Let's see, let's, we'll say every individual is initially a candidate for selection. Um, for the first score, remove every individual that doesn't have the best value for that score. Um, if you're down to one individual, that's the selected individual. Otherwise, move on to the next score and repeat. I didn't write that up super well. Um, there are better uh, write uh, descriptions of this in the literature, but essentially you're saying, you know, it's a bit like you have um, an exam with a hundred questions on it and you, for each selection, you do this, it's different every time. For each selection, you pick one of the problems. So you say, oh, I don't know, exercise 34 will be the first one. And you look for all the people that had the best score on exercise 34, and you had to remove everybody else from contention. And then that subset that were tied for best on exercise 34, now you go to the next randomly selected problem, which might be exercise 13, you say of that subset, who's best on 13, which might not be as good as somebody else who did really well on 13, but they got eliminated already. Who did best there? You keep everybody who's tied for best on that one, throw everybody else out. You keep going through the scores until you either get to the end, in which case everybody's tied because they had the same scores everywhere and you just pick one at random, or you um, you get down to one, 
and you're like, yeah, you get to be the selected individual. Um, so Lex case works really well in a lot of problems. I've never seen it used for HIF. I feel like it would do well for HIF and might even, like if it does do well here, this could become part of a paper at some point because I don't know that anybody's ever done this. And it's been something I've been thinking about doing for years and never got around to. So, eh, I don't know. I don't think, you know, this would hardly be earth-shattering research, um, but there has been some discussion about um, identifying bit string problems that LexCase is good on. It's mostly used for things like software th synthesis where you're evolving programs and the scores are basically how well you do on a bunch of unit tests, essentially. So you've got maybe 100 or 200 unit tests and the Evolve program has to, gets a score on each one of those unit tests. Um, and I think there's good reason to believe that LexCase would do fine on simple problems like this, as long as they have multiple components. If it does, I think it'll be great. So I'm going to try to implement LexCase selection. Now, where this is going to blow up the world is individual has a single score at the moment. And that's not going to be good because we need to have a um, vector of scores. Um, now, we could... Actually, this might be the simplest way to deal with it. Is we could actually just rename this total score. I don't know if that's going to do a good thing here. Total score. Um, does it still compile? Did it find all the places? Um, it looks like it did. Okay. And then we could add pub scores vec i64. Boom. And it doesn't like copying a vector of i64s. Why did we need copy? I don't remember why copy mattered. If I take it out, maybe we'll find out. Um, maybe we didn't. Because now the errors all seem to be about the fact that, yeah, we're missing scores when we make a self. Okay, so maybe we didn't need copy. I'm not, maybe that got put in by me doing uh, taking the suggestion um, in too many places. So let's see, line 60. So we're going to need to have a um, ah, okay. Now, compute score is going to have to take it's going to have to return the vector of scores and then we will need to add them up which is gonna be kind of a pain so that's gonna be this compute score is gonna return a vec of i64 oops undo and that's gonna break all kinds of stuff um and then we would have scores and this is going to be scores dot sum I think exists nope sum does not exist I'm pretty sure sum exists somewhere um, do I have to say iter Look at that. I just had to say iter. So sum is implemented on iterators. So that's cool. 
So actually, individual now compiles. That's weird. But all these bit strings are not going to work because they're assuming all manner of excitement that doesn't work anymore. So let's see, where's our first problem? Line 38 in, oh, it's actually in population. Wah, wah, wah. Let's go there. Yeah, population died. Line 38, population. So we call this compute score here is now wrong. So this is going to need to be a vec of I64s and uh, then, okay, was that all we had to do there? Maybe. Bit string is line 110. Right here we call self. Compute score is going to need to return a vec of I64. And we're going to need to make. Oh, no, that's all we have to do because this new is going to do the right thing, I think. And then line 154. Oh, there's going to be a bunch of these. So each one of these is going to have to. Oh, interesting. Gotcha. So I have to change. So this is going to be. Um, uh, tricky. Uh, iter dot sum scores and we're gonna have to change hif so this is actually where life is gonna get really so both hif and count ones if we're gonna use this are gonna need to return the vector instead of the a single number. Now, this is a place where I kind of feel like the right answer is a trait thing, that there'd be a trait that would be to support lexicase selection and that that's really more general, but I don't know that I want to be that general right now. I think I'm willing to just say everybody needs to do lexicase and suck it up. So if everybody does lexicase and, and just has to deal, then count ones needs to return a vec of I64, and hif needs to return a vec of I64, and we're gonna have to figure out what that looks like. So, count ones is actually just going to be a vector of one or zero depending on the boolean so this is going to be needs to be a one or a zero and this is going to be collect that's going to go away. This should have failed because we don't have, yeah, we can't go from Boolean to I-64. So we need to say something like if bit one else zero. And I probably need to have that in curly braces. And apologies if you can hear the phone in the background. Why somebody is calling at this hour, I do not know. And this needs to be double starred? No. Oh, and that. 
Oh, I need curly braces here. So that really should have just been this. And why are you grumpy? Expected bool. Oh, I'm doing filter. I wanted like filter map or something, didn't I? Um, so let's see. Is it to? Yeah, you know, I thought about that. Um, so having, instead of having score be this, having that be another generic. But I'm going to need, I, I, I probably want the total score and the scores, which I guess could have been put together in some kind of struct. But I just, I decided again, because I'm, I'm just trying to get to doing some timing stuff that I'd rather just get it working and not spend endless amounts of time chasing around the most general possible solution. May come back and make it more general. I mean, so maybe it's even worth, um, uh, maybe make the score here a new generic type S. Um, now, why are you okay? Yeah, so it's, it's filter. I don't even want filter, I just want map. I was thinking somehow this was, it was filtering, but I want mapping. And I don't need all of that nonsense. And now I just need that. There we go. Whew. So that should do count ones. Now this one's a the hiff is more difficult because the implementation here is recursive. We have to somehow take that recursive solution and turn it into a vector of scores. So this could just be vec bits bit dot len. Um, oh, well, no, it wouldn't be that. It'd be vec bang. See, it wouldn't even be that. It can just be this, right? No. Do I need vec bang? Yes. Or two vec. Mm, do I care? I think I kind of like vec bang better. Now we get three scores at this level. This one for the left half, this one for the right half, and then this one. And so basically what we want to get the vector we get from here, the vector we get from here, append them together and tack this guy on as an element at the end. So how do I append two vectors or concatenate two vectors? Rust concatenate, it's probably like push. Um, oh, it has a method append. It has an append. So we give it another vector and it makes, it mutes that onto ourself. Or extend. 
Oh yeah, I've, I've even used extend. Um, do I care between the two of them? Uh, oh, mute append eats the contents of this where extend moves the second one and it can't be used anymore. Extend does seem to make more sense because we don't want it to be there afterwards. So I want something like lat mute scores if bits half length. So that's going to be that. And then I'm going to say scores.extend if and bits half len dot dot. And then so that goes away. And here I'm either going to want to add that single value or a zero. So this is going to be scores.extend vec bang that or scores, I lost an S here. Ah, dot extend back bang zero and then return scores. I think that works. That would be nifty if that's true. And now we're going to have a bunch of other um, places where we have the wrong types. That's my time. Yeah, we're in good shape. 164. So I'm just going to have to keep uh, be good to have something that avoided this nonsense over and over again. Let's see, what do I really want? That's my so if I do that there, 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 all of those I think are better now. One sixty four, oops, or not. Uh, Oh yeah, so that needs to be scores, scores, scores. That'll make, and we're not happy. Why are we not happy? Uh, oh, compute score is returning a I64 instead of a VEC of I64. I feel like I tried to make a type thing for this function somewhere but then I got into all kinds of weird compiler nonsense that was messing things up um, okay want well, to share those guys now 229 oh yeah I could have just done a push that would have been better actually could catch and then I, because then I don't need to make this vec only to get rid of it. Yeah, good catch. Thank you. Um, that's why I should never be allowed to program on my own because I do stuff like that. Okay.
Now, whoa, this needs to be a vac. I sixty fours, and now we need to go to lib. And make child is going to oh, I have a make child method down here, and it's going to return of oh, the right here score is returning an i64 and I want a vec of i64s and I need so this needs to be scores uh, scores dot iter dot sum and scores Oh, it all compiles. Now, we should probably change display to display all the errors. Which is going to be a little ugly, potentially. Because now this is going to be a bunch of scores. We could just display the total score, but we could also put scores in here. Well, self dot scores, yes. And those don't have a display, so this is going to need to be that for now. And does this do a thing? Ooh, that's ugly. That is ugly. Well, actually, let's go to count once because it'll be easier to make sense of target problem count ones. Nope. Uh, oh, I've got target problem. Oh, we are doing count ones. Really? Really? Oh, maybe that's why these were doing so well. That doesn't make sense. I wouldn't have expected such uniform blocks if we were just doing count ones. And these numbers, count ones would, would be zeros or ones. They wouldn't be, so it's like this is not, my target problems count ones is not doing the right thing. Mm, that's not good. So args compute score. If args target problem is count ones, we use count ones. If it's if, we use if. That seems pretty reasonable to me. Target problem is of type target problem. It defaults to HIF. Uh, maybe. Did I mess that up? So that's used in the initial generation 
But then... But no, because that gets embedded in the... So make child... Does make child have that in? It receives a score as an argument. And where so this score here needs to be set. Oh, and it's set to hiff up here. So you're completely correct. So really this should have been scorer and this whole match business should have been up here. Scorer. And this should have been that business there. So score, we're going to decide which one it is, and then we're going to pass it in here. Gets passed to make child. That looks a whole lot more like something that might work. Aha! Well done. And it solves the problem instantly. Um, which is not super surprising. And if we set the bit length to be like 128, it would take a little longer, but still solve it. And if we set it to like 1024, um, it's definitely taking... It's sweet time about things. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Now if we come back to 64 and we go to HIF, having this be in the middle like this is not the most helpful. Then, okay, now we get the block behavior that we were expecting. Um, cool. So that, I think, sets things up for Lexicase. And maybe we commit that and call it quits because actually implementing Lexicase is going to be a bit of a bother. And I definitely want to commit what we've done here because we had to change so many places. Um, yeah, so I'm going to want to commit this and then we can implement Lexcase, uh, next time. So in the remaining couple of minutes, we should talk a little bit about next time, just so that we're on top of the insane schedule that's making me crazy. Um, because life is awkward. Um, so, uh, let me, um, uh, actually I'll start by copying this. So here's the Discord link and here's the Twitters, and those would probably be the most, um, the easiest ways to keep track of what will be sort of a strange period coming up. So normally there would be, um, so th there's a special one-off stream tomorrow, that's Thursday, um, from 1 to 3. 3 p.m. Central Daylight Time, focusing on the um, segmented file system client um, for our systems lab. Um, so we started that last Saturday um, and got a bit of a start on it, um, but uh, We've only done one session on that, so we'll work on that um, 
tomorrow. There will be no streams on Saturday. Um, the West Central Climate Network monthly meeting is in the morning. Uh, and then the Prairie Light Film Festival starts on Friday. And there's a whole bunch of movies we're going to go see. One of which is Saturday afternoon, which overlaps the second stream. So no streams on Saturday. And then next week, things should be reasonably normal. Um, so streams on Tuesday morning and Wednesday evening, so next week, mostly normal. Um, Tuesday morning from eight to 10, no. I'm not getting up at eight, come on. Um, from 10 to noon, uh, noon a.m.? Yeah, I need a nap. Wednesday from seven to 9 p.m., that's this slot right now. Um, uh, and Saturday morning from 10 to noon, but no stream Saturday uh, next week. So that's the eighth from two to four because, um, oh, actually, actually, I, I take it back. Neither of these streams can happen because we've got to start um, our radio show at noon, so I'm not going to be here. So no streams Saturday next week. Um, so it's the 50th anniversary of the campus radio station and I will be, um, my wife and I are doing a anniversary show um, from noon to two. And so 10 to noon and two to four are both sort of shot by that. So there will be no streams on Saturday and this is the part that's really kind of a bummer, is there will be no streams at all uh, the week of the 10th. Um, that's not true, actually. Tuesday the 11th can still happen. Um, Tuesday the 11th will still happen, but no streams after that until Saturday no actually probably not that Saturday um, uh, you think I'd have this worked out better um, probably really until Tuesday the 25th uh, Tuesday the 25th of October so we'll be uh, family vacation, um, visiting uh, our child who's a grad student in Madison uh, now, uh, and my sister and my mother up in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, and some other family for a work weekend. Long story, you don't care. But basically, we're going to be gone for two weeks. So, And I thought about trying to haul gear around and stream from other places, but I'm just gonna like declare that a vacation and not pretend to be streaming when I'm not even sure how well it'll work. Um, so uh, we'll have some streams coming up um, this week and next week, but uh, then there'll be basically two weeks off and um, I will be sad without you. But um, I'm sure you will find something to do with your time. And I will be back and we will program together because it is fun. Um, so I think that's awesome. And it's exactly 9 o'clock. I'm going to call that a win. I've been Nick McPhee. This has been Unhindered by Coding. Um, and Zitsu can get some sleep at last. Go Zitsu! Um, and I'll... Uh, commit all this stuff offline so you don't have to watch me do that and i will see everybody tomorrow uh no what did i say yes tomorrow i've got a one-off stream tomorrow afternoon 
Um, otherwise, I would see you uh, next Tuesday. So thank you very much. Go get some sleep or whatever you're doing, wherever you live, what time zone you're in. And I will see you folks later. Ciao.